How did you know who I am? <laughs> the shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> It's report of that damn shadow character again. But you said he was only a rumor. I'm sick of the shadow business. He is meddling in police affairs. This time tomorrow. I'll put a task force on him. Precinct reports police investigation of murder at the Museum of Natural History. That's Margot Lane. Her father's a scientist working for the War Department. Do yourself a favor. Stay away from her. She's strange. She hears voices. That's what they say. Really? Since I was a little girl with my cousin Harry, I could hear what he was thinking. Just pick the thoughts right out of his head before he said a word. It was the strangest thing, and I never was able to... I like her, boss. She's different than your usual dames. More than even she knows. How's that? She has abilities she's completely unaware of. No kidding. You gonna see her again? No, it's much too dangerous. Dangerous for who? For me, Mo. For me. Who are you? Shiwan Khan. Mouse descendant of Genghis Khan. I traveled to this country in Genghis Khan's holy crib to absorb his power in three days. The entire world would hear my roar and willingly fall subject to the lost empire of Shan King. I know that inside you beats a heart of darkness. You dip into it every time you put on that hat and cloak. Join me. You are Yinko, the Butcher of Lhasa. That's not my name anymore. But it is, nevertheless, still who you are, isn't it? I need a metal analysis of this. The metal is bronzium. Could bronzium conceivably be used to make some sort of a weapon? Theoretically. Fashioned into a bomb, it would be catastrophic. I guess you'd call it an implosive, explosive, submolecular device. Or an atomic bomb. On July 1st, 1994, The Shadow arrived on the big screen, produced on a relatively large budget of $40 million. It failed to live up to expectations and bombed at the box office. By early 1995, it had only managed to recoup $48 million worldwide. On its opening weekend, its numbers were pretty good, but it was facing stiff competition from The Lion King and Forrest Gump during its second week of release. Both were huge hits with audiences. The Shadow's numbers just dropped sharply. Reviews at the time were certainly mixed, but more leaning towards the positive. Many praised its visual design, special effects and performances, but the story came under criticism, with feelings that it was too messy and disjointed, and lacked any decent action sequences. Universal Studios had made efforts to get the movie some attention, and took advantage of the IP, following a similar marketing strategy to Batman from 1989. They pushed it as a big superhero movie. Many licensed products were released, such as a board game, a novelization, a pinball machine, a video game that was sadly cancelled before release, and a range of action figures were produced by Kenner. The Shadow was created by Walter B. Gibson in 1930, 
and the character was really the first anti-hero. He popped up on the radio and in the comics long before Superman and Batman. His radio introduction was a huge success and Orson Welles would later add his voice talent to the show in 1937-38. to Its popularity inspired the show's sponsors to translate the character into print form under a year later. Gibson was an extremely fast writer and penned hundreds of stories on The Shadow to the late 40s. The Shadow in radio form was called Lamont Cranston, but in the pulp comics he was called Kent Allard, who took on the identity of Cranston. The 1994 film follows the radio show's original roots, and he doesn't take on any other aliases other than being known as Ying Ko by the people of Tibet. During the 1950s and 60s, The Shadow didn't really have any more original stories published, but instead reprints were made of the original comics. In the 1970s, DC Comics introduced a short mini-series that was met with mixed reviews and never gained much momentum. If new fans wanted to read up on the hero, they could obtain reprints of the classic publications if they wanted to start from the beginning. So come the early 90s, The Shadow was very much out of the public domain. He wasn't a big hitter like the DC and Marvel characters, he was very much a thing of the past. Once Batman hit it big in 1989, studios were desperate to find comic book characters to take advantage of. The option to make a movie was picked up in the 1980s, but it wasn't until the early 90s that Universal Studios showed an interest. The Shadow had already been given the chance on the big screen, during the height of his popularity. The first was a series of six shorts made by Universal Pictures in 1931, based on the Detective Story Hour, but I don't think any footage still exists. A full-length movie in 1937 was made called The Shadow Strikes. It's a real slog to sit through. Columbia Pictures provided the most entertaining adaptation with a 15-part chapter serial in 1940. You see Cranston in his classic outfit fighting crime. This is the only one to watch if you are at all intrigued by the early adventures of The Shadow on the big screen. In 1946, there was a trio of Shadow movies called Shadow Returns, Behind the Mask and The Missing Lady. They were all very cheap productions, which featured little screen time with the Shadow in action, just bland crime-solving mysteries. There was a pilot called The Invisible Avenger that was never picked up for syndication. It was based on the Shadow, but I watched a bit of it and barely saw any connection to the comics. It just so happens to use the name of Lamont Cranston. Come the 1980s, producer Martin Bergman had purchased the rights to The Shadow and struggled to get it off the ground for years. Robert Zemeckis and writer Bob Gale were attached in 1984, but soon dropped out to work on Back to the Future. Come 1990, screenwriter David Kep was hired to write a new script. At this time, he hadn't written a screenplay to a movie that was a huge hit, but during the next couple of years, he became a big talent in the industry with his work on Kalito's Way, Death Becomes Her and Jurassic Park. Many of the existing previous drafts couldn't balance the right tone to please the studio. Some scripts were way too dark or had too much comedy. David managed to find the right balance. He was a fan of the radio show that had reruns on Saturday nights when he was a kid and he wanted to maintain the tone of the radio dramas. David wrote the screenplay with Alec Baldwin in mind and felt lucky that his first choice was hired to take on the role. He found Shi Wan Khan to be the most fascinating character in the Shadows list of villains. Like all great villains in comics and books, Shi Wan is a dark reflection of the Shadow. He is his equal but has different ambitions to use his powers. Russell Mulcahy was hired as director. Famous for his music videos for the likes of Duran Duran and many other popular bands in the 1980s, and of course for his feature film Highlander and its dire sequel. Russell was always noted for his strong visual style and flair for editing, which would prove ideal for the superhero genre. I believe this was the last big production he worked on before he returned to smaller budget movies and TV shows. He did return to direct a big mainstream film in 2007 with Resident Evil Extinction which is probably the most visually appealing movie out of the lacklustre franchise. The Shadow was shot at Hollywood's Universal Backlot on five sound stages from late September of 93 till late January of 94. They lost a week of shooting due to an earthquake that destroyed the Hall of Mirrors. This is probably a good reason as to why on film the final battle ended so quickly. The Shadow has a pretty small cast, but some excellent choices were made to bring the characters to life. Alec Baldwin plays Lamont Cranston, aka The Shadow. Alec was very impressed by the script and was eager to play the role, and David Kep injects a lot of Alec's own humour into the character during the early stages of the production. When Lamont puts on his outfit, his face transforms into an almost evil version of himself. His nose gets bigger and face becomes more angular. 
it's a nifty disguise to avoid people recognising him. These extreme features seem similar to the gangsters in Dick Tracy. It's like a bad guy stereotype. You have to look strange and ugly. Alec has a great voice and look that makes him fit so well into that 1930s world. It makes me think Alec would make a great Bruce Wayne. John Lone plays Shiwan Khan, a descendant of Genghis Khan. Shiwan Khan is another student of the Tolku, who possesses even sharper mental powers, but has resisted redemption and stayed evil to fulfil his obsession with ruling the world. John Lone shot to fame for his work on The Last Emperor and is one of my favourite actors. It's surprising he hasn't done that many films. He popped up in Rush Hour 2, but his acting credits are few and far between, which is a huge shame. Penelope Ann Miller plays Margot Lane. Margot has certain psychic qualities, with the ability to read some people's minds. When she meets Cranston, she realises she's able to read his thoughts, putting his secret identity at risk. Cranston's abilities don't seem to work on her, but the stronger mind of Khan sees her become one of his unwilling puppets to try and kill the Shadow. Peter Boyle plays Mo, a taxi driver who works as an agent for the Shadow. Whenever Lamont needs assistance or a ride somewhere, Mo is there to help. I hope Lamont doesn't take advantage of these free taxi journeys too much, because Mo does have to earn a living. Sir Ian McKellen plays Dr. Reinhardt Lane. Dr. Lane works for the War Department and is working on a secret project. Shiwan Khan takes control of him to use his skills and recent invention to take over the world. Ian McKellen is a fantastic actor, but his American accent in this is highly questionable, not his finest effort. The always fantastic Tim Curry plays Farley Claymore. Claymore is an assistant of Dr. Lane and fancies his daughter Margot and is desperate for a date with her, but she doesn't fall for his charms. Claymore becomes a servant of Shi Wan Khan. Veteran comedian Jonathan Winters plays Wainwright Bath, the commissioner of the police. Wainwright is the uncle of Cranston, and he is sick of his playboy lifestyle. Sab Shimono plays Dr. Ray Tam, a professor of the science department at NYU. He becomes one of the Shadow's new agents after he saves his life from a mob of gangsters. The film opens in Tibet not long after the First World War. Lamont Cranston has turned to a life of crime, and his darker instincts have made him a warlord and opium drug king under the alias of Ying Ko. One night a mysterious monk haunts his dreams, and servants of the Tolku kidnap him from his palace. The Tolku has been watching Cranston for a long time, and informs him he wants Cranston to be a force for good. Cranston resists at first, but is convinced when attacked by a deadly knife that has a mind of its own. Lamont goes into training for seven years, and learns to cloud men's minds, using psychic hypnosis. He can also alter reality to hide in the shadows, becoming invisible to the others around him, unless in direct light. After training, he returns to his previous life in New York to fight crime. He terrorises the underworld and recruits the citizens he saves to be his agents, providing him with informants with specialist talents. Lamont is seen as a shallow playboy. His uncle, commissioner of the police, expresses his anger with the shadow, saying he is meddling in police affairs and wants to hunt him down. Lamont uses his powers to change his uncle's mind and keep him off his back. However, the shadow's secret identity is endangered when Cranston meets Margot Lane, an eccentric socialite who is a natural telepath. He shows an interest in her abilities, but he learns he cannot keep his thoughts from her and risks her reading his mind. At the History Museum, there has been an unexpected delivery of a sarcophagus. It houses Shi Wan Khan, the last living descendant of Genghis Khan, who plans to fulfil his ancestor's goal of world domination. He escapes and seeks out Cranston, discovering his secret hideout. Khan offers him an alliance, sensing that a thirst for power still exists in his heart, but Cranston refuses. Khan leaves Cranston a rare coin that he learns is made of a metal called Bronzium, an impure form of uranium that theoretically can generate an explosion large enough to destroy a city. This suspicion is confirmed when Cranston learns that Margot's father Reinhardt, an atomic scientist working for the War Department, has vanished. Shiwan Khan hypnotises Margot Lane as she tries to find her father and sends her to assassinate the Shadow, hoping that Cranston will be forced to kill her, thus reawakening his darker side. Instead, Cranston breaks Khan's hold on her, but she is now aware of his secret identity. She wants Cranston to save her father. Cranston prepares to rescue Dr. Lane 
and to defeat Shi Wang Khan. The Shadow incorporates classic methods of visual effects and of course modern techniques such as CGI. They were on the cusp of the digital revolution and had to think carefully about what could be achieved practically or in digital form within the means of their budget. The Shadow had over seven visual effects companies involved in achieving the matte paintings, miniatures, optical work and CGI. The director of photography originally wanted to shoot the film in anamorphic scope as he felt they could have broken new ground by shooting in anamorphic, but the digital effects companies fought against it, wanting to achieve the effects in 185 to 1, which would be easier for them. By today's standards, the digital trickery is very obvious. On many scenes, you can see the level of grain increase and the color shift slightly so you know within the next second or two, a digital effect will appear. The digital effects were mastered in 2K resolution, which was very high for the time. The animator said it was difficult rendering all the frames in a quick amount of time and without using too much storage space. Having 96 gigabytes of data to store back then cost a lot of money. I think the most challenging sequences for the FX team was creating the dagger and the clouding effect used to hide the shadow. The animated dagger has held up well over time and the textures seem detailed enough to sell the shots. The smoke-like effect of the shadow as he appears out of nowhere to attack his victims is a bit hit and miss. It's a difficult effect to achieve and you can tell visually what's happening but it has a strange frame rate in some scenes. They cut around it quickly to avoid lingering on the shot for too long for it to take away any of the impact the effect is trying to do. The best visual effects in the movie are the miniatures and matte paintings. The miniature of New York has this great sweeping shots of the landscape. It's a visual treat and of course the beautiful matte paintings that expand the 1930s period have really stood the test of time. The one painting that really blew me away was seeing the busy streets during the daytime. You can see where the matte line joins with the live action footage if you look closely, but it's still pretty much a seamless shot. There are also paintings that open the film with the poppy fields and the reveal of the Tolku Palace. The poppy field sequence in HD does exhibit lots of picture weave. The image doesn't seem stable. I'm not sure if it's the transfer or a problem that couldn't be resolved at the time. There is one shot where you can clearly see the wires. The shadow picks up one of Khan's thugs and the black support cables are very visible. But in all the effects have stood up over time. The decision to limit the amount of CG and optical work has given them more time to focus on the individual shots to push the realism. Jerry Goldsmith composed the score to The Shadow and yet again provides an incredible soundtrack. He makes use of a full-blown orchestra with the help of synthesizers. Jerry Goldsmith has already tackled the superhero genre with Supergirl in 1984 and in Coming to The Shadow he was in his element. It retains all the bombastic action cues you come to expect from him and of course the recognisable themes that he and John Williams were the master of. The score was released at the time on CD, but only 30 minutes of music was made available, which is shocking considering how much he wrote and the high quality of his work. He composed over 80 minutes of music, and it was finally released on a 2 CD set in 2012. The Intrada release features all the music written for the film, plus alternative cues and the original album on the second CD. To further push the movie's awareness, a music video was produced to promote the song Original Sin, performed by Taylor Dane, which was featured during the end credits. The song was a cover of one written in 1989 for the musical team Pandora's Box. The single was released on June 26, 1994 on cassette and CD, but it failed to hit the US Top 100. However, it did break into the UK charts, hitting number 63. I recall seeing this music video a lot during the summer of 94 on MTV. I personally quite enjoyed the song. It's catchy and memorable and doesn't seem out of place when mixed with the visuals of the film. The music video is pretty funny though. Lots of dancers fannying around and Taylor Dane doing some power ballad poses. But the director chose to show a big spoiler by featuring Shi Wan Khan getting stabbed in the head. Social media today would scream spoilers. The soundtrack is still available from Intrada Records for about $30. It's definitely worth picking up and adding to your collection. A video game was released to tie in with the movie. 
Ocean Software, who dominated the 80s and early 90s with their licensed based video games, planned to release a side scrolling beat em up for the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive, but at the last minute it was cancelled due to the poor box office results of the film. It's surprising they cancelled it when it was pretty much complete. The game's ROMs for the Super Nintendo were leaked a few years back, and it is actually a really good game. The story roughly follows the film. The player controls the shadow through several levels, fighting against waves of enemies. The player has two bars of energy. One is the life bar, and the second allows the player to perform special attacks. Invisibility, gunplay, speed running, and a dome shield that knocks out everyone in its path. The graphics and gameplay were pretty solid, and it's a surprisingly good effort from Ocean. I think the game would have been well received at the time and sold well. Despite the movie's poor figures, I think the game could have existed on its own. It's definitely worth emulating and giving a go. There have been discussions and rumours of a remake since 2006. Director Sam Raimi is a huge fan of the character and was desperate to make a movie in the 80s, but couldn't obtain the licence so he created his own superhero movie, Darkman. You can see Darkman has some visual similarities to The Shadow. In 2006, it was announced that Sam Raimi had picked up the rights to produce a movie, but there hasn't been much news since, until 2012, when Sam Raimi said they are still working on a script and were struggling to develop a good story, and the film would not be produced as planned. I would happily support a remake though. I believe there is a lot of potential to deliver an update. I think retaining that 1930s period setting would be ideal possibly having it shot in black and white to further push the film noir appeal, or maybe going with a muted colour palette and similar visual direction of, say, Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, which was a fantastic tribute to classic action serials. I first became aware of The Shadow when seeing adverts on the back of Superman comics and video game magazines. The poster looked so cool, but when it came to theatres I never saw it listed. Either it just came and went, or my local cinema just didn't show it. Once it hit VHS to rent in 1995, I finally got to see it, and on first impressions I recall finding it a bit boring. As a kid I was desperate to see more of The Shadow in action, but he has very little screen time, and the movie favours his public persona of Lamont Cranston. As I got older and re-watched the film on better video formats, such as Laserdisc, then eventually DVD, I began to appreciate the movie more, especially its music and visual design. Its strongest point is its production design. It does look stunning. The set pieces and the use of the back lot at Universal really creates a lived-in world. The streets are busy and full of life, unlike, say, Dick Tracy, which seemed empty. It's the 1930s in a very nostalgic way. It's a heightened reality with no sign of the recent depression, but hints of growth and prosperity. It's funny to see a lot of the behind the scenes material have the cast praising David Kep's script, when it was the screenplay that came under a lot of criticism. Maybe it was compromised during the shooting process, with specific scenes being trimmed or deleted entirely at the request of the studio. The origin story I felt was a bit rushed. It's daring to start out with the main hero being a bad guy. It's an interesting twist and unexpected, but the whole process of him training and the backstory of the Tolku is very thin. It cuts to a prologue of text skimming over his history and jumps to seven years later. It does seem like a cheap way to cut through the backstory and thus not having to shoot any material. But to argue that, in respect, it follows and pays tribute to movies of the past, which utilise text prologues to set up the story. The final confrontation is a big letdown. By that point, the shadow has really been a bit useless. He gets his ass handed to him when he jumps into action, and for the most part, clumsily takes villains out. When he confronts Claymore, he makes a silly error and gets trapped in this giant water tank. Why challenge him in such a risky area? He has to get Margot to save him due to his incompetence. He seems much more effective as Cranston than when turning into the Shadow. The face-off against Khan is very short-lived. Before Cranston reaches Khan, he has to deal with Claymore and his henchmen. He spooks out Claymore, but Khan's main bodyguards are nowhere to be seen. They just disappear from the film. There must have been something deleted, but why remove an action scene considering it has been so limited so far? The Shadow enters the Hall of Mirrors, looking totally badass with his outfit and two Colt 45s. Then he begins to destroy the mirrors with his mind, and takes out Khan with a shard of glass. He doesn't kill him, but damages the part of the brain that controls his psychic powers. 
This all happens within a space of a few minutes. It was reported that the set piece was destroyed during an earthquake. This is perhaps why they use an optical effect when he begins to crack the mirrors and the last remaining shot of the real mirrors is when they explode in sequence. From what I read online, Khan attempts to haunt Cranston of his past and shows images of his previous exploits to either weaken him or take him off guard. It would have been more exciting if they got into a fight or pushed the use of the mirrors as a way to confuse Cranston. It's a scene very much like Enter the Dragon, with Bruce Lee getting misled by Han's reflection. They should have indulged in that more. I think if the comics were still in publication at the time with news stories and adventures being written, the public would have come out in larger numbers to see it. I certainly had no awareness of who he was and never saw the Shadow novels in the stores. So despite it being a comic book movie, it no longer had a real strong connection to pop culture. Even the average person with no interest in comics would still know who Spider-Man or Batman was, but the shadow? They would draw a blank. The movie is full of cliches, and they don't break much new ground, but these work well within the story's narrative, for it not to become an issue. The love story of Cranston and Margot is a little forced, being that she is the only female character in the movie, despite Lamont's supposed playboy lifestyle. However, at least they give her a role within the story, for example saving him at the water tank, rather than just providing a romantic interest or threatening his independence as a hero. Despite the love story being cliched, there is great chemistry between them, and it characterises the drama of 1930s romantic scenes well. I think younger audiences will find The Shadow to be a very underwhelming experience. Like me as a kid, I wanted to see more of The Shadow in action and defeating gangsters. But there is little of that, and most screen time is spent with him trying to investigate Khan's plans. An older audience, I think, will find those moments interesting. The conversations between Cranston and Khan are excellent moments of dialogue, and you can see Alec and John are enjoying those scenes during their confrontation. The movie balances out the serious and comedic elements really well. It's funny when it needs to be and serious when called for. Tim Curry is very much cast to be a comedic element and does a great job with the material but is very much the bumbling coward you've seen before in other films. You don't see him working as a scientist, you're just told he is one. The film uses a lot of exposition to fill backstories or characters' motives. It is a bit lazy in that regard. The characters in some places are very two-dimensional, and it's lucky they got good actors to bring more to the table. With The Shadow being part of the pulp series of movies, including The Rocketeer and The Phantom, I think it's the strongest out of the bunch when it comes to the visuals, but in terms of its story and action, it's unfortunately the weakest. The Rocketeer has the heart, The Phantom has the action, and The Shadow has the best visuals. If you want to get hold of the film on Blu-ray, there are a couple of releases available varying in quality and content. For the USA, there is a Shout Factory release that includes a recent retrospective that runs at about 25 minutes long. It interviews key members from the film and offers some insight into the production, but doesn't go too deep. With no on-set footage and none of the problems or its box office failure were addressed, it's a pretty thin retrospective on Shout Factory's behalf. The UK also received this version recently. In Germany, a couple of years back, they received a version with extra content, minus the new documentary. It has the original behind-the-scenes material, interviews, trailers, a music video, and includes a booklet, which naturally is in German. The German release has more grain in the picture and has a little more detail. The recent ones have the grain removed and a stronger contrast, but both versions are easy to pick up and not too expensive. I've always had a soft spot for this film, despite its nagging problems. There are simple things in the movie that could have been addressed to improve it. I don't want to say, oh, they should have included more action to make it better. But in retrospect, it lacks any real excitement. They could have had more fun with his powers and made the face-off between the Shadow and Khan have a more epic conclusion. There are nuggets of great ideas that just don't fully get translated on screen. The visuals and music will instantly draw you in, and the performances are all very good to keep you invested, but don't expect too much from it. It loses its momentum and feels rushed to get to the end. It's certainly worth adding to your collection though, if you haven't seen it. Just go along for the ride, and you will get some enjoyment out of it. The Shadow is not a perfect movie, but it certainly has enough charm and visual flair to warrant re-watching it again.
Margot Lane to kill me. Kill you? If I wanted you there, Yinko, I would have your liver on the pole by now. I sent a girl to be killed. I had to kill the shadow when I came here. I said I want you to leave right now. And there was only you. Tell me, how did you kill her? She's alive. And she's a danger to you. She now knows exactly who you are. How long will you let her live? How long before your pure instincts take over? You want to see into my eyes? I think. Go ahead. I know something. I Look at them. More. I'm on to your plan, Khan. You still don't have the beryllium sphere, and without it, you can't complete the bomb. Besides, you know I'm going to stop you. <laughs> oh, that knife. Recognize it? I took it from the Toku. No, 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 I correct myself. I took it out of the Toku after I ran it through his heart. My father's disappeared. You're the only one who can help me find him. Just be gone when I get back. How do you know I won't tell anyone who you really are? I know. Where? Not here, you idiot. In the building. Find him and kill him. <laughs> You're finished, Khan. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel, and also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.